Okay, well, for this morning's message, we're going to be looking at um, the book of Hebrews, which uh, actually talks about all the aspects of Christ's mediation and how much better He is than all the old covenant mediators. So we're going to look specifically at Hebrews 5, verses 1 through 10, and I think we, we hit almost everything uh, in this passage this morning. Uh, which is good because uh, th this is really the, the kind of message we probably all prefer, and that is when we get into the Word of God and we look at it piece by piece, we call this exegetical you know, sermon. Um, but we see it coming out of the text, and, and we need to see that. You know, we need to make sure that everything we believe is grounded in the Word of God. But let me begin by reading it, Hebrews 5, verses 1 through 10. The author to the Hebrews writes, For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God to, in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself also is beset with weakness. And because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins as for the people, so also for himself. And no one takes the honor to himself but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Just as he says also in another passage, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. By the way, I should mention, because I, it isn't really a part of the sermon, when it says in verse 9 that he was made perfect, it's not that he wasn't perfect already, but it just simply means that he was perfectly suited to fulfill this role of mediator. Now that I think about it, I, we, we do talk about that. Um, so he becomes complete. He becomes mature. He, he grows, as it were, into that um, state that he needs to be in order to do this work faithfully. All right. Well, we've been asking the question, why should we be willing to let go of everything that we have in this world, everything that we might possibly gain, even our own lives to follow Jesus? Remember, that is the cost of discipleship. We must be willing to pick up our crosses. That means die to our our own lives, you know, to doing what it is we wanted to do and and really giving it all over to Christ. That doesn't mean we have to change our vocation necessarily, but it does mean that we have to do what we do for the glory of God, and we need to make sure that what we do uh, is serviceable to Him and to our neighbor. So why should we be willing to give up everything to follow Christ, and why should we love Him? And we have to love Him to follow Him, even more than those that we hold most dear on earth. Well, we know that we should because we have this kind of love in our hearts already by His Holy Spirit. That's our new nature. That's our new inclination. But we've also been looking at the fact that we should because of everything that Jesus has done for us, everything that God has done for us in Christ. And we've, we've looked at a number of things. But last week, we began looking at what Jesus has done and what He continues to do for us as our mediator. Remember, the mediator is the one that stands between uh, two parties in order to reconcile them. And the mediator that the Father has sent stands between us and Him in order to do what is necessary to reconcile us. Now, we've seen that that's exactly what He's given to us in Christ. And in order to do this, He has equipped Christ with three offices, that of prophet, priest, and king. And last week, we saw what it is that He did and what He continues to do as our prophet. And as our catechism puts it, he declares to us the will of God for our salvation. You know, he declares the gospel. He tells us what the good news is. And then he shares with us how to live for the glory of God. 
Now we saw he did this in the Old Testament. He was the one who revealed the gospel first to Adam and Eve, the first fallen of humanity through that curse that he pronounced on the serpent, on the devil. He revealed the gospel to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob through the Abrahamic promises. He revealed it to David through his promise to raise up a son and establish his kingdom forever. And of course, throughout the prophets, he reveals Christ. He reveals him throughout the Psalms, everywhere in the Old Testament. It's, it's all pointing towards Christ. So in the Old Testament, he's exercising the office of a prophet. When he comes into the world, he preaches the gospel to his people. Before he ascends into heaven, he commissions his apostles to preach it to the world. And we saw that he continues to preach it today through his word as we read it, through his ministers as they read it and explain it and apply it, and even through all of us as we share his gospel with others. And again, remember, if, if God had not given us Jesus as our prophet, if he had not willed to declare to us really the way of salvation, and that includes, of course, providing one, we would have never known. There's nothing we, we, we could have done, and we would have perished forever. We need Christ as our prophet. And let's not forget, too, Jesus also speaks through the creation. He made the world, didn't he? And the creation speaks continually of him. Not the gospel. We need the Bible for that. But it does speak of God and his glory. And, of course, his word gives us the gospel. Now, it's, it's so easy for us to take the gospel for granted because we hear it every day. We hear it at least week to week. Uh, we hear it so often because Jesus is our prophet and he is continually declaring it to us. And that's why we should love him for showing us the way of life. But of course, he's done more than just show us the way of life. He's provided the way of life, and that's what we want to look at this morning when we consider his second office as our mediator, that of priest. As our priest, he made a sacrifice for us, and he prays for us. Now, the first question we want to ask is, why do we need a priest? And really, when we're asking this question, we're, we're really asking the same question we asked last week. He says, why do we need a mediator? The reason is because our sins have made it impossible for us to approach God directly. Okay? We cannot do it because God will not allow it. Adam, by his sin, cut us off. And of course, we've cut ourselves off over and over again through our own sins. The Bible, actually God declares to us in his word that he is not like us. God is holy. God loves only that which is good. And he hates perfectly everything that is evil. And because he does, he won't allow us, because he cannot allow us to come into his presence because we are ungodly. We are evil. Isaiah writes in Isaiah 59 verse 2, and this is really just speaking about the sins of his people that, that divided him for this time. He says, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, <clears throat> and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. Sin divides us from God. The Bible says God will not allow sin in his presence. No unholy person can stand before him. Remember what he said, even to Moses, no one can see my face and live. Well, that's why God instituted the Old Testament priesthood when he desired to have a relationship with Abraham's children. And by the way, there had to be sacrifice, there had to be mediation throughout the entire Bible if anyone was to have a relationship with him. But, and certainly Adam and Eve were sacrificing, Adam was a priest in those days. We know that Abraham was as well and Isaac and Jacob. But by the time we get to Moses, God institutes the priesthood in order to have this relationship with the children of Abraham. Now, this priest needed to be there. This priest needed to stand between them to offer sacrifices for their sins and to pray that God would receive them. Notice in chapter 5, verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men 
in things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. So the office of a priest is to make sacrifice in order to bring about this reconciliation. And that he might do it in a way that was merciful, in a way that was compassionate. God ordained that this priest would be one of them, or one of us, you might say, that he might know what it was that we're going through. Well, we think, well, who else could it have been? Well, I suppose it could have been an angel. It's the only other rational being that God has made. It couldn't have been anything else besides a man or um, an angel. But he ordained that it would be a man so that the man might deal more gently with those who, uh, with, you know, for whom he was ministering. Verse 2, he can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself also is beset with weakness. And because he also was a sinner, every time he approached God, this is the priest that God had ordained for his Old Testament people, every time he approached God, he had to make these sacrifices first for himself and then for the people. Verses 2 and 3, he himself also is beset with weakness, that is, he is also sinful, he has to deal with his own sins, and because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins, as for the people, so also for himself. The point of this is, if man is to approach God, there must be a mediator, there must be a priest to make this sacrifice and to pray that the two parties would be reconciled. Well, as we know, the gospel, the good news, is that God has given to us such a priest. He has given to us a better priest, a perfect priest. He has given to us the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one thing the author to the Hebrews wants us to note is that only God could have done this, right? No one can simply choose to be a priest, to choose to enter into this office. They must be called by God. God has to have the man of his choosing. When God set up the ceremonial system through, through Moses, he called Aaron and his sons to be his priests. Verse 4, and no one takes the honor to himself, and notice that it is an honor to hold this office, but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. And we actually have an Old Testament example of, of those who, who tried to become priests without God's call. And for the most part, they weren't all of them from the tribe of Levi, but a number of them were, and we saw how the Lord responded to that. Remember Korah and Dathan and Abiram and On, how they said, why can't we be priests? And the Lord saw this as rebellion, and we know what the Lord did to them. He judged them severely because only God can call a priest. Well, the point, of course, for, for us is... Only he could do it, but he has done it. Verse 5, so also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. God called him to be our priest, and he chose a superior priest, as we're going to see in, in many ways. Um, one, first of all, who would live forever. The Aaronic priests were, were limited, and here I'm drawing upon other parts of the book of Hebrews. They were limited by their lifespan. Actually, I think the Lord only allowed them to minister up until maybe age 50. That was certainly true of the Levites. Um, they were limited by death. They couldn't continue. But Christ remains a priest forever. Uh, verse 6, just as he says also in another passage, you are a priest forever according to to the order of Melchizedek. And of course, he has a superior sacrifice and he is also a superior prayer warrior. And that's what I want us to consider as we think about Christ our priest. Let's think about his mediation for a moment. Now, first of all, that which we, I think, most often think about when we think about the mediation of Christ, what he's done for us, what the gospel is all about, and what he does for us as a priest. And that is, he made a sacrifice for us. The only sacrifice that can wash away our sins. 
Now, again, this is what we usually think of when we think of him as priest, Hebrews 7, verses 26 and 27. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because he did this once for all when he offered up himself. So first of all, this priest has offered a sacrifice which takes away all of our sins. And he has done this once for all. Hebrews 10 verse 14. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. See, Christ doesn't need to be offered often. Uh, there are those who, I think, believe that, that he does. I know in the Roman church they, they have this idea, this continual sacrifice of Christ, and perhaps they're thinking that somehow they are offering up again the only offering that he's made so many years ago for, for all time, but it, it almost seems like it's a fresh sacrifice. No, the Bible says it was only once, and that was all that was needed. Now, this, of course, sets it apart from the animal sacrifices that Aaron and his sons made because they were never able to do this. And the author to the Hebrews draws this contrast in chapter 10, verse 4, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And he also says that through these sacrifices, there was this continual reminder as they were offered often of the fact that these sacrifices could not take away their sins. And so the question we might ask is, well, if these sacrifices couldn't remove sin, then why were they offered? Well, they did have their purpose. The first thing they did was they provided, I think, a kind of what we might call a ceremonial cleansing. That's something that we see. There's all these rites and ceremonies in the Old Testament that, that were used to purify people, to purify the priests, and there were sacrifices made to purify the whole congregation of Israel, to make them holy. And this is what allowed God to live among them without breaking out in judgment because he saw in those sacrifices the sacrifice of his son. Now, one thing we need to realize, though, is that those sacrifices did not actually take away their sins. Okay? And most of those people... We're, we're, we're not true believers in Christ. Their sins were not forgiven. And we need to remember that when it comes to forgiveness, a person can't be forgiven of just one sin or two sins or ten or a hundred. You're either forgiven entirely or you're not forgiven at all. And that's exactly how these, these sacrifices, they either, you're either forgiven com completely or you're not forgiven at all. Well, the, the fact is they weren't forgiven at all unless they trusted in Christ. So these sacrifices, first of all, provided this ceremonial cleansing that allowed God to live among them. However, we do know that there were people in the Old Testament who actually were cleansed from all their sins by looking forward to the Messiah who was coming as they looked to him through those sacrifices. So if a worshiper was offering an animal and he remembers the promise of God that this Animal is really a picture of the blood that would be shed in the future, and they look to that sacrifice of the Messiah who was coming, then they would be forgiven of all of their sins. But it's not the blood of the sacrifice of the animal that cleansed them of their sins. It was the blood of Christ that the animal's blood actually pictured. The same thing with regard to the Passover lamb. Why did God spare their households? Let's not forget that most of these people who were spared in the Passover, were subsequently destroyed in the wilderness because they rebelled against God. Okay? They, they didn't truly know the Lord except a few of them. So these sacrifices, again, they, they have this ceremonial cleansing effect, but those who actually see the blood of Christ through the Passover lamb, they actually are saved by his sacrifice and not by these animal sacrifice. So again... These sacrifices could not, which is why, of course, God has provided the only sacrifice that could, that cleanses of all sin once and for all, 
And let's not forget it's the only sacrifice that could because of the gravity of our sins, the, the guilt that was ours having sinned against infinitely holy and worthy God. Only the sacrifice of one infinitely worthy could have cleansed us. Now here's another interesting point, and, and I want to make sure you understand this because it is something that's true, but we want to make sure we understand it the right way. You remember how the author to the Hebrews said that these priests had to offer sacrifices for themselves and then for the people. Now, again, I say this very carefully. There is a sense in which Jesus had to offer a sacrifice for himself. Now, how, how is that possible? We know that Jesus was sinless. We know that he is the spotless Lamb of God. We know that he is infinitely perfect, infinitely worthy, never did anything that was wrong. But we also need to remember that he did become guilty when our sins were imputed to him, right? And that's the reason why he died. That's the reason why God poured his judgment out upon him. That's the reason why he sacrificed himself and had to sacrifice himself and had to die was because our sins were imputed to him. But that sacrifice of himself actually paid for our crimes, the crimes that, that were actually laid upon him, that killed him and put him in the grave. That sacrifice of himself cleansed him of that imputed guilt. And as a matter of fact, the Bible points to the resurrection as the evidence that God had received payment in full for the sins that put Jesus in the grave. How do we know that our sins are forgiven? It's because Jesus rose from the dead. That's what Paul's arguing in 1 Corinthians 15. If Jesus had not been raised from the dead, we would still be in our sins because our sins were laid upon him and they killed him and they put him in the grave and he's still in the grave. That means that they're not forgiven and we're going to go to the grave too. But the fact that he was released from death means that the Father received the payment. Those sins were forgiven, and that means that, that we're freed from God's judgment. That means that we too will live. Christ has brought life to us. But let's not forget, those sins put him in the grave, and his sacrifice cleansed him of that imputed guilt. He had no personal guilt, but our imputed guilt is what was cleansed. Now again, I think we're very familiar with that aspect of Christ's priesthood and his mediation. But let's not forget to be grateful for that because apart from that, we would be lost forever. But there's another part to it. And that's the part we often forget about, that he prays for us. Now we, we saw how his prayers for us began on earth, John 17. I'm not going to read it again, but that was Christ praying for us. Father, I don't pray for these alone, but for those who will believe on me through their word. That includes us. So he's praying for everyone whom the Father has given to him. And we know that Jesus continues to pray for us in heaven. Hebrews 7 verse 25 he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. The Bible says that Jesus is in heaven at the right hand of the Father, constantly praying for us. And that, that's a part of his priestly office. It's a part of his work as mediator. And the Father always hears him. He hears him because Jesus is the obedient son, and he hears him because Jesus pleads his own perfect sacrifice on our behalf. Now, one of the most encouraging things about Jesus' intercession for us is that he knows exactly how to pray for us because he knows what we're going through. Remember that that's why God appoints men to minister on behalf of men. As we saw in verse 2, he can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself also is beset with weakness. And so that our mediator might know what we're going through, he comes into the world in the same way we do, which is in, by birth, and he, he grows through every stage of life to adulthood, 
so that he might experience everything that we experience. The author to the Hebrews tells us that Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted. Chapter 4, verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, again, our weakness towards sin, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Jesus knows what it is to be tempted. He also knows what it's like to overcome temptation, but he knows what we're going through when we're tempted to do evil. He knows how difficult, well, actually, he doesn't know our difficulty to obey because he doesn't have our sin, but he knows what it is to obey. You know, he, he's the obedient son. He obeyed God perfectly. And he knows what it's like to suffer for obeying. Although he was a son, chapter 5, verse 8, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And through his life experience, he was shaped, he was, he was made to be a perfect mediator, as I pointed out before in verse 9 of chapter 5. Having been made perfect or complete, uh, perfectly suited for this office, he became to all who obey him the source of eternal salvation. And that word obey there can either mean those who trust him, those who obey the gospel, trusting Jesus, turning from their sins, or perhaps it's referring to those who show that they actually have trusted by obeying him. But he is the source of our salvation because he is a perfect high priest. He is now advocating for us from heaven. You know, he's our lawyer, so to speak, an advocate. They called him advocates in, in England. Uh, one who stands before the justice throne of God pleading for us, um, we might say his intercession for us keeps us in the grace of God. But you know, as I say that, I'm, I'm thinking we're no longer in the courtroom of God because we've, we've been delivered from that and we're now in the family of God, but there's still a sense in which Jesus pleads for us, right? Listen to what John writes in 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2. My little children... I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And then Paul tells us in Romans 8 that Jesus is the one who is continually praying for us, interceding for us, and it's through this intercession that, that our entrance into heaven is guaranteed. Romans 8, verses 33 through 34. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God. Who also intercedes for us. So, even though we have this new relationship with the Father... Um, we are his children um, in the family of God, yet we are still in need of intercession. And Christ is that advocate. He is that intercessor. He is our priest who is pleading his merits on our behalf continually before the throne of God. So again, the, the, the point behind all of this is, is this. Jesus has done all of this for you if you're trusting him this morning. He's all of this and more as, as we're looking, you know, at prophet, priest, and king. And the question is, how should we respond to this? Sometimes, again, these things really don't dawn on us. And really, there's nothing I can say that's going to make it, uh, you know, sort of dawn on our, um, our imagination, uh, on, you know, become real to us in the way that it should be real to us because it is real unless the Spirit of God reveals it to us. And that's why, of course, while, you know, while we're preparing for worship, we pray that, that God would anoint us with His Spirit for worship because it's really the Spirit's work to do this. So our prayer should be that these things would not lull us to sleep, that we wouldn't get drowsy and, and just, you know, just think, well, I've heard this before, this is really nothing new but that we should really appreciate what it is that the Lord has done for us because if he didn't do the things he had done, laying down his life, praying for us on earth, 
if he wasn't pleading before the Father right now in heaven, we would never see heaven. We don't want to take that for granted. We want to understand what Jesus is doing for us so that we might love him, we might appreciate him, we might give him glory and honor. When, when we, we think about praying to the Lord, we, we adore him, we worship him, we thank him. There are reasons why we should do that, and these are those main reasons. We would have sunk forever in an eternity of suffering in hell if it were not for what Jesus has done. How much should we love him? Well, of course we know we should love him in the way we're called to love him. With all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength, and we should give everything to him, our lives to him, sacrifice them to him, and love him more than anyone else and anything else in this world. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, and let's, be, let's think about these things as we prepare uh, to come to the table that reminds us again of the sacrifice Jesus made of his life for us on the cross.